Tonight we have Sam McMaster, she's the Director of Student Services, Erica Heckler, Cassingham Counselor, Michelle Hipsley, Montrose Counselor, Jordan Croft, Nationwide Children's Hospital at Cassingham and Montrose, Brittany Bolin, Nationwide Children's Hospital for the Middle School, Bree Newoff, I think that I said that correctly, Nationwide it's Roof, but that works. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> Nationwide Children's from Maryland and jo Joanne Manarelli, Student Services. She's our mental health specialist at the district. I'm going to hand it over to Sam. Thanks. We also have with us um, Edin Mojis, who is our supervisor for, nation, for our Nationwide Children's Hospital clinicians, and um, Sierra Warfield, who is our school counseling intern at Cassingham Elementary. So she's with us also today. And we also have Emma Heideman, um, our FEEP student at Montrose as well. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Welcome, Emma. So I will go over just some brief information, and then I'll have the counselors and our nationwide um, support team jump in and just offer any additional comments or input that they want to provide. I know our school counselors have added um, some information to the slide, so I'll let them um, talk about those as well. But I really just want to start off and say thank you again for everyone who is here tonight, um, giving up your time to, to be here and um, to support our students and our family. And again, most of the people we introduced, because most of you are here this evening, um, but I will add it on this slide and, and parents, this slide will be, these slides will be available to you. So it does list our school counselors in each of our buildings, um, our nationwide children's hospital clinicians, and then our district level support for special education, which is Joanne Manarelli, who's our mental health specialist. And then Michelle Jones, who many of you have heard from before, who is our district wide board certified behavior analyst. I am not going to read this whole sheet to you. Like I said, you're going to get a copy of this, but this is something that we use internally to kind of help make sense of what we are trying to accomplish as a district. And while we all work collaboratively together, um, there are things, there are slight differences in how we approach things and, and what we do. The things that I like to point out on this, this chart and in the next couple of slides, you know, our school counselors are our first line of defense with our kids. They do the work in the classrooms. Um, they are uh, the first ones that we go to when we have needs for students. Um, certainly our, our connections with community resources um, and they link with our, our teachers and our families. Um, and, and so when, when we get questions about, well, why, you know, why can't the counselor do this? Or why are we doing a referral to Nationwide Children's? Or who's Joanne and what is she doing? And so we get those kinds of questions. I think the biggest um, delineation on this chart is that Joanne is tied to students who are only in special education and have goals related to their disability area in mental health on their IEP. So typically it's a student who is being serviced for a mental health disability. So that's not to say that we don't have students with learning disabilities who also have mental health needs or need support in the area of anxiety, for example. Um, if, so I, if, I'm sorry, <laughs> I was going to add something. So I, my ahead. services are attached to a goal. Um, so there's, there needs to be a, a social emotional goal on their IEPs. And then I support those services that are provided by the intervention specialist. Right. Yep. So that so that's a, just a big distinguishing factor is if there's not a goal in the IEP or the, the evaluation didn't determine that that was an area of need for services. That might be why a child on an IEP is getting services it, through other avenues from either direct interactions with our school counselors or um, that we do a referral to Nationwide Children's. And sometimes that is because of a, a traumatic event that has happened or something that is not connected to the child's area of disability. Um, or sometimes a child will start with Nationwide Children's Hospital be evaluated for special education, be offered services through the district, but already have a relationship with the nationwide clinician so they may continue services with that person. So when, when we say we bring all this information to you to, to help and to clarify, sometimes it makes it more confusing. <laughs> so that's why we'll give you an opportunity to ask questions at the end. But really what's great about this is we have a lot of amazing people who are working for our kids in the district, um, all with slightly different roles and responsibilities, but all for the same end purpose. Um, with our Nationwide Children's Hospital Partnership, they are linked with a psychiatrist through the hospital. They also work in the summer and coordinate summer services at Jeffrey Camp. They collaborate with other Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, providers when needed. 
um, differences with nationwide is when services are provided, they are provided through the summer and over school breaks, whereas school based services with our counselors and with Joanne are typically related to school based concerns and issues so really typically occur just during the school the school year. And students can have outside counseling as well um, when I'm involved, um, where that's not the case when um, nationwide is. Um, so they could have a community therapist as well as myself, and then we coordinate our services. And then Sam, I was just gonna add in regarding the last slide. Um, Dr. Gata, who's our psychiatrist, not every child will see her, it's just based on um, need and um, if that's what the family wants, but um, it is available if needed. Thanks. Okay. And then this is just a, a model of tiered interventions that we use. And I think what's important here is just to note that <coughs> everyone is available at all three tiers and they provide different resources and services during those times. So at the basic level in tier one, what we, we call is our universal programming. So that's what's available for all students. Those are things where Particularly our, our school counselors are in classrooms, working with students, working with classrooms, um, working with groups of students, um, and also supporting that positive behavioral and intervention supports in the buildings. Um, this could be uh, nationwide children's hospital clinicians could be involved in some of those processes. When we get into smaller groups, interventions through the RTI process that also can involve counselors, nationwide children's, general ed teachers, interventions provided through that process. And then when we get into more specific interventions, that's when we are looking at um, our special education services, nationwide children's hospital, our BCBA, 504s. Doesn't mean school counselors aren't involved at this point. They're probably more involved than they have been in the past. Um, but, but these are more specialized services that may extend beyond what, um, what our school counselors are doing with the general population. You're going to hear a lot of terminology and sometimes it gets confusing. What's the difference between a school counselor and a nationwide clinician? Licensed social workers, licensed independent social workers. What does that mean? Um, mental health specialists. So typically in the district, to clarify this, our school counselors are district employees who work with all of our staff, students, families, um, and are typically assigned to one building. Our nationwide children's clinicians are contracted services through our Adam H grant. They are um, private pay, which means that um, when families engage in services through nationwide children's, and I can ask um, Edin or anyone else who wants to add in, into this statement that I'm about ready to make. <laughs> when we do referrals, um, there is a process, there's an intake process. Um, there is a financial piece that, that is attached, which, um, it just means that it goes through the hospital's process. Um, so that is separate from the school. The school is not involved in that process. The benefit is that the services take place at school during the school day, which is why it's called school-based therapy or school-based counseling. I could explain that, Sam, if you're yeah, looking for Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so we accept all Medicaid and all forms of private insurance. Um, with the private insurance, we have a financial department that the family would be linked with and they would work closely with the family. The goal is for us to not turn any family away. Um, and the financial department would work with them as um, they turn in paperwork or whatever else is needed for them to come up with a plan of a payment plan that they're able to handle. But what I, you mentioned earlier with the Adams grant is that in the meantime, if there is a crisis, if there's a need, the grant allows us to provide those supportive services, part of the tiers that you mentioned as well, um, for those families while they're waiting for the financial department. But that's, that's, a, that's a program that we have for all families that do need those services. Thank you. Okay, and then a um, lot of information on this slide, very helpful. Um, and I think there's a link on here somewhere that too, when you get the PowerPoint, you'll be able to, to link to the school counselor, National School Counselor Association, but it really does lay out the, the role of school counselors in school. And they really do do a lot of things for all kids. So I, Erica or Michelle, I don't know if you wanna jump in and just talk a little bit about what your roles are. Sure, I'll, I'll start and then Michelle, you can piggyback and fill in all the things that I left out. Um, I'm Erica Hecker. I am the school counselor at Cassingham Elementary. I think this is my 16th year um, in the 
district as a school counselor in my 35th year in education. Um, thank you for inviting me to this presentation tonight. Um, I love working with, with parents in the community. It, students just learn better when we work together. So um, I'm happy to be a school counselor in Bexley City Schools, a little bit just about the role of school counseling. It's changed a lot back since when um, I was in school and they were called guidance counselors and told you what college to go to or what career to pick. Um, school counselors now are licensed professional um, educators um, with a master's degree in school counseling. Um, we also take a board exam and now are required to have a 600 hour internship in schools to work, to work as a school counselor. So um, the unique things about school counseling is that we work with all students. And oftentimes we may be the only counseling professional who is available to, to students for a variety of needs. Um, one thing that differentiates us from, from other mental health professionals is we work on um, our, one of our main um, goals is to work on prevention. So we have a real focus on awareness of mental health and do a lot to promote pro-social and emotional behaviors for our students. Um, another thing is we're recognized to, um, to look for those mental health warning signs, um, whether it's um, attendance, mood changes, um, friendship changes, um, um, grades, um, look for those uh, mental health warning signs and, and like Sam says, be the first line of defense in getting some, um, some help for that student. Um, we do provide mental health counseling on a short-term basis because we have um, huge caseloads. Um, the American School Counselor Association recommends 250 students to every one counselor. Um, we work hard. We work with, with um, everyone um, to get to make sure that students have access to a counselor. Um, another thing we do, as Sam said, is we work in partnership with other mental health um, professionals, our NCH counselors, we couldn't do it without you, um, and community um, mental health um, providers as well. We provide referrals and resources, community resources. We also work in collaboration with, with teachers, administration, family, community stakeholders, um, and we really ad advocate for students and families to meet the needs of the whole child. And if you go to the next slide, Sam, I think that's where um, there's a link at the bottom that you can click on later just about our, our specific role in mental health. And then I'll let Michelle pick it up from here. Uh, if you can go back one there. So um, it's important to recognize we're not just kind of randomly pulling stuff together that we think, you know, is, you know, for lack of a better word, touchy-feely. Um, but there are some very clear standards that we go by, and these are very research uh, dri driven. I'm not going to go through all of these. I've hyperlinked them all um, in order for you to take a look at them later. Um, oh, wait, I'm not going to, I'm going to need you, Sam, to click on them because I can't click on them from my, so the first is CASEL, and this is the framework that all state models work from. And if you go down to the interactive model, just a little bit more, you'll see those, oh, well, back there you go, right there. You'll see those main components of self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, social awareness, and relationship skills. And when you click on each one of those areas, so like if you click on self-awareness, um, it'll give you specifics to what does that mean? So the ability to understand one's emotions and values, um, self-management, um, and I'm not gonna read, go through all of those, but it's important to know that those are the five cores that we continue to build our SEL learning from. From there, the other one is our Ohio um, SEL standards. Um, and these were based off of the CASEL model. Um, and so again, our tier one um, uh, social uh, emotional learning, our, our teachings, um, are based off of and are very much in line to our Ohio standards. Um, again, not going to go through all of this, but it's important for you to recognize that we're just not popping in and doing something that we just decided that day. We are really using um, some research-based um, frameworks to do our to our lessons. And then the last is our ASCA mindsets and behaviors. 
Um, this is actually uh, the Ohio School Counselors Association. And these are our standards that we um, guide all of our um, deliveries through. So that's just a quick version of the large frameworks that we work from. So then on the next slide, um, it's going to talk about our second step curriculum because that is truly our core um, uh, across the district. So K-5, our students um, all participate um, in the second step curriculum. Um, it is research driven and you'll see later at the end um, how it aligns with multiple, um, multiple alignments. So the first, if you want to click through, Sam, the first unit is on um, growth mindset, and that just helps kids to learn how to pay attention, manage distractions, develop a growth mindset, which you spend a lot of time on, as well as goal, um, goal setting um, strategies. The next is emotional management. And um, I am certain that you have probably heard from your elementary student that they needed to, that you need to maybe stop and belly breathe and name your feeling and calm down. And when they do that, I hope that you calm down and you praise them for recognizing what you need to do in that moment. Um, because it is a constant that our kids are hearing that. Not only do they hear that from us when we're working in this unit, um, but it is the first thing out of our mouths and out of teachers' mouths to let's first calm our body because we can't make good decisions when our amygdala is firing away. Um, so the next unit is emotional management. From there is our empathy and kindness. And we work a lot at um, understanding how others are feeling as well as ourselves, and then putting ourselves in other shoes. Um, and, and how do we show people that we care? What are those acts of compassion? And then our last unit is our STEP. Um, and so the biggest part that we really um, work with kids on is learning how to say that problem without blaming. Um, once you're able to say a problem without blaming, um, so avoiding those words like always and never because of you, um, it's super easy to begin to think of solutions. And so the way that you begin to say a problem without blaming is first really understanding what is the other person's perspective. So if you can understand the other person's perspective, you know your own perspective. So now you know what you both need or want, and then you can come up with solutions that are gonna work. Um, we quickly explore those outcomes and then pick the best solution. Um, so we spend you know, several weeks on that problem solving model. And again, that is something that we continue to use, whether students are coming into our office um, or we're in the classroom or teachers are using that on the playground. Um, and we hope that you're using that at home as well. All right, so as I said at the beginning, our second step curriculum really lines up with so many different models. So we have um, the CASEL alignment. So you can see how um, it lines up with CASEL. Um, the next one that'll show you um, how it lines up with the mindsets and behavior from the ESCA model. Um, there we go there. And then the next one, the next two links are actually um, pr best practices that we follow here in our district, which is a trauma-informed care and how that second step in, uh, supports trauma-informed care. And then the last one, uh, restorative practices. Um, so those weekly lessons really um, combine so much and they're the, that tier one consistent um, language that is used throughout the entire district, K-5. Um, and it's the reason why um, like we are not constant firefighters, you know? And I say that because we are in that prevent, we're in that prevent so that our numbers aren't spent, you know, always working with individuals. We spend a large portion of our time at the elementary level in prevention um, so that we can begin to build upon those, those skills. So that's our tier one. Um, real quick, a little bit that's unique to Montrose is this year we do have a wellness room. Um, and this wellness room is a place where students can go to learn about calming strategies. Um, like a hands-on kind of place. Um, so students will check in um, and then you'll see over on the left side there, um, they can choose one activity that's sensory based. Um, that could be anywhere from putties, um, drawing, uh, it's just a variety of things. Um, and they can choose one of those activities, go to a space and then learn what um, tools help define their calm. And then after that, they return back to class. And so, 
Um, this has really helped students to begin to own their own um, uh, mental wellness, so to speak, because so often adults want to go in and they want to fix and they want to um, solve it. And now kids are really learning in a hands-on environment. How do I solve this? What really works for me in order to find my calm? Um, so they spend about 10, 12 minutes and then they return back. Um, some of our students are on a schedule, which um, we are real careful with um, finding those times when kids maybe are most dysregulated and then um, have them scheduled for the wellness room. Um, and then there's a handbook there if you ever want to take a look at like all the expectations and the research that went into it. Um, but it is very clear it's a learning environment. It's not just a place to come hang out. Um, although sometimes staff does. <laughs> and that's it for me. Okay, well, thank you. So a lot, all of that was our tier one um, intervention or tier one programming that's happening with our school counselors. Can I have either a school counselor or one of our nationwide clinicians talk a little bit about what that looks like when we have a student who needs more intensive needs. And as a team, there's a decision that's made um, with the family to do a referral to Nationwide Children's. What does that process look like? Um, and, and Ed, and I don't know if you wanna jump in there or one of the school counselors from the school's perspective, that would be helpful. Well, it's a great collaborative effort, I will say, in that, you know, um, one, we're constantly just talking with our NCH clinicians. So when we have a student that we're beginning to see some of those warning signs that Erica talked about, we then begin to kind of have those conversations with our clinicians and then make the determination if a referral is most appropriate. And then from there, you know, connect with parents. But um, I'll let Ed and Erica add on to that. Um, I think you, yeah, I think you summed it up, um, Michelle. It's great to work in partnership with our NCH clinicians um, to, to, to consult with them um, and then share that information with parents. Um, it's not the only avenue. I mean, parents have the option to take their kids to any counselor that they want, but it's um, a great asset to have it right in the school building. Yeah, I agree with the team. Um, like for example, we're here today because we often want to be collaborative. We, we love working with the school. We love becoming one. In fact, I want my staff to, when you walk in through the building, unless you're seeing their NCH badge, you wouldn't know if they didn't, you know, they don't belong in the building. So I'm gonna have some of the teams talk about um, the, the process for each of their buildings, just so you could get to know them. But really what happens is when we do, um, when a student is identified to be receiving our services, that would definitely mostly come from the school counselors, either through the teacher or the parents or speaking to the school counselor and they would identify that student. And then when we receive the referral, that paperwork goes to our resource coordinator. And the reason why it goes to our resource coordinator is really because the resource coordinator would work with the parents one, to connect you with the financial department if you do have a private insurance, but two, to understand if, if, the, if the student really is appropriate for school-based uh, program in the scope of school-based. So for example, a student who's really struggling with anxiety and needs so much more services than what we could provide may end up going to the mood and anxiety this, um, clinic that we have instead of just school-based. So it's really for the resource coordinator and the family to discuss what is the most appropriate services and if the school base is in the scope of practice for the family. And then once that happens and this resource coordinator would state, okay, this, this student does um, is in a scope of school-based program, then one of our clinicians, and this is where they could come in and start um, sharing their views, is that they would receive the, the, the student's case. And so they would be able to call you, meet with you. Sometimes we call the families before we even start working on our case, just to tell you who we are, what the program is about and give families the options. And as Erica has said earlier, that you don't have to connect with Nationwide Children's Hospital. You could go to many places. We're actually um, supportive if you do, but we are in a school building to provide crisis support resources and information, no matter who you're working with. Uh, I'm gonna let my team discuss um, the process when they receive the case. I can go ahead and go, um, just to add a little bit um, to the initial um, process um, of what I do at Cassingham and at Montrose. Um, I make sure to definitely collaborate and talk with the teachers as well, 
just because they have that daily information on the student and to do a classroom observation so that you can see the um, student in their natural environment um, and kind of not go into, if they do become linked with services, not come into it with, I have no idea maybe who the student is and have a little bit of, oh yeah, I might've noticed this uh, myself and kind of make more connections. Yeah, I think um, the only thing I would have to add, I'm at the middle school and so um, sometimes classroom observations aren't as widely available, but I keep, um, I send individualized emails out at the beginning of each quarter, just kind of introducing, well, letting the teachers know I'm seeing that specific child so that they can keep involved with me and I always check in with them to kind of see what's going on with the kids so I can know what's going on. Um, even though we're at the school, we always try to involve the parents as much as possible as well. So that way we can provide interventions for things that's going on in the home. So that might be, that might look like just providing resources to the parents of things they can do, or that would be helpful or some more family therapy. Um, and in that we can be more community-based where we're meeting in the home um, at a local place or the parents coming into the school. Um, so lots of collaboration and a lot of different aspects in our role. And I'll just add for me at the high school, um, a lot of collaboration starts with the guidance counselors. So kind of finding out the students who are having a harder time or struggling, um, or there might be a crisis where I meet with a student in the kind of more preventative realm, um, and then talk to parents and talk to guidance counselors and kind of figure out whether or not school-based is appropriate. And if that's the case, then we, you know, kind of move forward with that referral. Um, and if not, kind of refer them somewhere else. But a lot of a lot of the high school collaboration starts with guidance counselor meetings and just kind of figuring out the students who are are struggling with school or um, other trauma or depression or anxiety. Those are kind of some of the, the major ones that we see. Great, thank you. I do have, I still have the slide up. So I did want to share just a reminder that some of the summer program offerings that are in the course catalog, um, the course uh, registration is open until I think the 20, 25th maybe. Um, so there's still an opportunity for that. I don't know if someone wants to go through these and just kind of explain what these groups are um, that we're running over the summer. And then I, I'm not sure, um, Erica and Michelle, if there were additional things that you're doing over the summer that are not on this list. Um, sure, I'll, I'll hop in because I have um, I, uh, another thing that uh, counselors and um, NCH clinicians do. I know Jordan and I work in partnership a lot of times facilitating small groups so we can see you know, Jordan can work with even more students than just um, the number on her caseload, but working in uh, working on um, small groups to deal with a specific concern such as anxiety or worry or um, self-control. Um, this last summer, Jordan and I did a group together and really enjoyed it. Um, this summer, I am offering um, a program called Rocks, and that's a hyperlink that you can look on, click on um, that takes you to the Rocks program. It's a, it's a specific program for girls. I'm offering it for girls rising fourth and fifth graders um, to um, empower them and um, teach them, you know, some, some self-esteem, empowerment, and assertiveness skills to help them build good relationships now and for their future. That'll be a, a two-week group. Um, Sierra and I are running it together um, this summer. Great, thank you. I can add I can talk about the other ones if you want. Sure, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so the skills groups, that is the all of us Bexley clinicians are going to be kind of teaming up and doing that along with some of our other clinicians from other school districts helping out throughout the summer. Um, last year we did things a little more specific like we had just a social skills group and then just a mindfulness group. This year we're kind of just throwing all the skills together because we realized that they really do overlap quite a bit and we are talking about all sorts of things. So our skills groups that kids can sign up for will be going um, 
pretty much all through the summer and each week we'll focus on something different. So mindfulness might be yoga. It might be walking outside, drawing, um, self-esteem, just practicing that positive self-talk, um, all of that kind of stuff. And then we do mix in the anger management and everything. So each week will be a different topic. Um, and so if your kiddo is signed up, they can come to every single one of those or just some of them. It doesn't, we really wanted it to be pretty fluid because we know summer schedules are very busy. Um, and then as we get back into August, we'll do some back to school prep groups for students going into middle school from the elementaries and then middle school to high school. And then Brittany, I can let you talk about the DBT group. Yeah, so I'm um, fortunate to be certified in this specifics group uh, therapy training. Um, so it's just about teaching kids emotional regulation skills, distress tolerance, um, being able to deal with some of those stressful situations internally. Um, and so that is offered, I believe, just for the middle and high school ages this year. Um, so we will be offering that as well. Um, yeah, sorry, something just happened above me and I don't know why. <laughs> That's okay. Just Thank to you. add, um, sorry, Sam, just to add, this is what the Adams Grant does. It helps us create all these programs and it's all free for families, including when we go into Jeffrey Mansion and provide those sessions into the classrooms or we provide the teens that's gonna be working there. We're gonna be providing them trauma-informed care just so they can recognize it and understand it. But that's what the grant does. It, 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 it gives us the freedom to really work with all of students with all of their needs and try to think outside the box and knowing how to meet them where they are. Oh, I can talk about Jeffrey just a smidge more. Uh, so we also work pretty closely with Jeffrey Mansion and Bexley Parks and Rec. So um, doing their, I always forget, what, SoCo, schools out, camps on, the after school things. Um, so if any of our, some of our clients are enrolled in those programs. And so sometimes we will go and see them after school. Or if one of the, a different kid is having a problem, we can go talk to the camp counselors and kind of discuss that with them. But then all summer, we also will go and uh, again, the Bexley, our little crew is going to be trying to lead little social skill groups for uh, parks and woods, the camps at Jeffrey Mansion. And we just base it off what those counselors are seeing. So if they're seeing a lot of pushing that week, then we talk about like hands to self. So um, I always compare it to to, for my kids, what Miss Reeve is doing all school year, we're trying to like help connect that a little bit so that when they start back, our school counselors don't have to catch up quite as much. Um, and we can also see our kids that are our own clients at Jeffrey Mansion all summer. So it's a really good partnership. Great. Thank you. Okay. I think that was the bulk of the presentation.